Thank you for that introduction. Thank you so much for hosting me and, and everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm a little trepidatious about delivering the, the Global Economic Trends Lecture about America, uh, but I suppose it's a, it's a relevant reflection of where we are right now in our politics uh, and in the global conversation that, that so much of what's happening in the global sphere really is devolving into fights about domestic politics. Uh, and, and in a sense, what I'd really like to talk about is, uh, is why we can't just do globalization, why the theory under which we have been pursuing globalization, we have assumed that globalization was a good approach to really everything we thought we wanted to achieve has not been panning out. Uh, and I think the point of departure for that is not so much the rise of Donald Trump or Donald Trump's success, uh, which frankly is, is a wildly overdetermined phenomenon. Uh, Donald Trump, if he had not been running against 17 other Republicans, would not have gotten the nomination. If he had not been running against the single worst politician of our generation, would not have won the general election. Uh, and even then, he lost the popular vote pretty, pretty substantially. So uh, the conclusion to draw is not, well, Donald Trump happened, everything must be different. Uh, but I think what's been incredibly striking is the response to his election, which uh, among the the, the pundits and the experts, largely both left and right of center, has come down to believing that we have a marketing problem. Uh, either that people out there don't understand how good they have it, uh, that they don't understand that things are hard and the policies we're pursuing are the best ones you can pursue, uh, or they're somehow kind of too racist and xenophobic to care. Uh, and, and I don't think that's right. And I think that that perspective is is leading us down a dangerous path of essentially refusing to learn any lessons uh, until it's too late. Uh, in, in a democracy, a miserable majority is everybody's problem. And uh, we currently face a situation where, roughly speaking, the majority of Americans have seen very long periods of stagnant wages, declining family and community health, uh, and are rightfully outraged and, and frustrated by the direction that policy has taken.
we shifted into a mode of consumerism in which consumer welfare was all that mattered. Uh, and we did this culturally, especially in the 1960s. This with public policy as we launched a war on poverty that was premised on the idea that some people did not have enough resources, and if we gave them more resources, we would solve the problem. And so all of this came together to this idea of the economic pie, the premise being, if you grow the pie, everyone can have a bigger slice. And if some people's slices aren't big enough, you can always, you know, cut some off of your piece and put it on somebody else's plate. And who doesn't like pie? Uh, which, uh, which has a certain logic to it. Um, the problem is when you watch what happens when you put this theory into practice. So what we've been fighting about isn't whether the economic pie is the right measure. We've been fighting about what's the best way to grow it quickly, and then we've been fighting about how much redistribution to do. Uh, this is a map of the New York Times. Every county in the country is shaded by its share of personal income from transfer payments. So of the dollars earned in a county, how many of them are actually earned in the labor market versus how many are coming from government programs. And you can see in 1979, we were a pretty beige country. Uh, some parts get a little darker red, but by and large, you've got kind of 10%, maybe 20% from government transfer payments. Uh, and a few areas pushing up into the 30%. And, and our GDP was about 6.5 trillion. And this is what the map looks like in 2014. Uh, we, we tripled our GDP, GDP right? Pie, pie got much, much, much bigger. Uh, and we massively expanded our redistribution. So if, if we flip back and forth, you'll see almost everything gets much, much darker red, except for a few very prosperous urban areas. So if you focus in on Boston or New York, San Francisco, you'll see it doesn't get any darker. But the rest gets much, much darker. You've got places in the country where the majority of all personal income is now coming from the government. Now, this is, in terms of economic pie, a massive success. This is the whole premise of if you expand the pie and redistribute from the winners to the losers, everybody can be better off. And in fact, in consumption terms, everybody is better off. Even in those darkest red spots, people's material living standards are higher than they were in the 1970s. So if you look at this and, and you just want to sort of stand up and applaud for our policymakers, uh, you're welcome to do that. Most of us would, most of us would recognize that this is a, a catastrophic disaster for our country. Uh, obviously unsustainable, it reflects that we've done some things very wrong. And so there's something wrong with this idea of the pie. Uh, and what I think is wrong with it, what we missed, and this goes all the way back to Adam Smith, in the wealth of nations, he wrote, consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production, and the interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. The maxim is so perfectly self-evident that it would be absurd to attempt to prove it. Now, as a rule of thumb, when you declare your maxim so self-evident you don't have to prove it, you might have a problem. Uh, but this is, this is how economics works. Modern economics is built entirely on measures of consumer welfare. How we do public policy is built entirely on measures of consumer welfare. And yet, when we see intuitively the results, we're not happy. And so the alternative that I want to propose is what I call the working hypothesis. Uh, I wanted to call my book the working hypothesis. I thought it had like an edgy, Jason Bourne thriller kind of feel. The publisher said it had like a boring, wonky book kind of feel. <laughs> Uh, so we went with something else. But the working hypothesis is this, that a labor market in which workers can support strong families and communities is the central determinant of long-term prosperity and should be the central focus of public policy. And what I want to focus on today is talking about three things. How is this actually quite different from economic piety? Uh, fairly importantly, why might it actually be true? And then if it is true, what does it imply for how we need to be thinking about public policy? So how is it different? I think there are a few kind of holistic ways to think about it. One is, what are we actually going for? Okay, when you're talking about economic piety, you're always optimizing for growth. Whatever grows GDP fastest is the best policy. If you believe the working hypothesis, if you believe a labor market that's going to let people work and support themselves and their families is actually most important, you're actually going to optimize for self-sufficiency, which is obviously a very different measure. 
One thing that suggests if you're talking about economic piety, all you care about is that the gains to the winners exceed the losses to the losers. So if I have a policy that makes some people wildly better off and really, really hurts other people, as long as the better off is bigger, it's a good policy. And I'm going to, maybe I'll say and I can redistribute. Maybe I'm not actually going to do that. But at least conceptually, I'm going to call that a win. Um, the working hypothesis says that's not right. There's actually kind of a floor under which if you push people, that loss counts more. That's more important. And you can, you can defend that in moral terms, um, but you can also describe it in economic terms, which is that the marginal benefit to yet more winning for the winners just isn't as valuable as the marginal cost to the losers. If we take everyone who's earning $200,000 a year and get them up to $300,000 a year, well, everyone at $30,000 a year goes down to $20,000 a year, we've probably hurt the losers a lot more than we've helped the winners. Okay, even though in economic terms, we'd say there's been a massive gain. And then thirdly, it implies a pretty different way of thinking about what economic growth even is. So really the premise of economic piety at the end of the day is that economic growth is going to spin off all the other good things we care about. I mean, no one, not even the, the most rigorous market enthusiast or Adam Smith himself would say economic growth is the end unto itself. Our idea is that somehow, if we've got the growing economy, that is going to spin off all the other things that we want and care about. One thing we've seen in recent years is that might not actually be true. Uh, the working hypothesis flips that around. It says actually there are things foundational to our society in terms of the strength of families and communities, how we raise the next generation, uh, that actually matter a lot more. You're not automatically going to get with economic growth, but conversely that are likely to produce economic growth. It's a vision of economic growth as an emergent property that you get when you have a healthy society, not something you get by fussing around with the top tax rate a little bit more. And so, bringing this together, I want to give you a, a thought exercise to consider. It's what I call the 20% button. And here's the 20% button. There's a button you can push, and it would cause the most productive quintile of the labor force to instantly become twice as productive. And it would cause the least productive quintile of the labor force to drop out. So on net, this, is, this represents an economic gain. The top quintile is much more productive to begin with. If we double their productivity, well, we lose the lowest 20%. In aggregate, we will become much more productive. And the question is, do you push the button? And so why don't you go ahead, we'll start with, show of hands if you would push the button. Come on. <laughs> yeah, there's a perfectly good case for pushing the button. And also you can, if you want, as part of pushing the button, you can stipulate that you're gonna have some policy that mails checks to the losers, so they have just as much as they did before. Does that help you push the button? Yeah, now we got some other who wouldn't push the button? Some of both. Um, what I have found in posing this is that you end up actually with three groups. About half the people say, no, I wouldn't push the button. A smaller group says, yes, I would push the button. And then a fairly sizable number would push the button, but would prefer to fight the hypothetical than say so. Um, and so I think this is an interesting exercise for two reasons. One. Pushing the button is what we've been doing for 40 years. And, and, and black letter economics says, obviously you push the button, that's a stupid question. And if it's not a stupid question, then we need to think a little bit harder about some of these things. The second thing I think is really interesting about it, and, and is more relevant in political terms, is that especially for the right of center, this is the question that is blowing it apart. Lib right of center in the United States has always been a partnership between conservatives and libertarians. And when the goal was like fighting communism, they really kind of agreed, pretty much. Um, when markets were delivering good social outcomes, they pretty much agreed. They both like markets, but they have a very different view of markets. The libertarians see the market as the end unto itself. The conservatives really only like the market because they think it delivers good social ends. And if it starts delivering bad social ends, they're not as excited anymore. Uh, and so a group that always is, was used to agreeing on everything finds they disagree passionately about this issue, can't even believe the other side is answering it the way they are, and can't believe that all of a sudden they don't agree with people that they've always agreed with. And one way of understanding Donald Trump is that he essentially just sort of jammed his thumb 
into that womb. I mean, he's not necessarily a conservative or a libertarian, but what he represents is essentially that exact breaking within the right of center. So that's why at least the working hypothesis certainly is different than what we've been doing. Why is it true? I think there are two reasons it's true. One is that work is really important, okay? That although we measure everything in terms of consumer welfare, that in economic terms actually work is bad. The less work people have to do, the better. Uh, that's just not actually right. So work is incredibly important for individuals. Work, the social science research tells us, is critical to self-esteem and mental health. It's critical to life satisfaction and happiness. And happiness studies usually stink. I will be the first to reject almost any happiness study as useless. Um, good ones look at the same person over a long period of time because it gives you a baseline. And studies that survey the same people repeatedly over long periods of time show two very interesting things. One, we all kind of have an innate level of happiness. For whatever reason, some of us are just happier than others. Uh, you might, you're, you're a seven, someone else is a nine. Uh, and it turns out that almost anything that happens to you, birth, death, marriage, divorce, permanent disability, it causes a blip, and you adapt incredibly quickly and return right back to being a seven or a nine, as if it had never happened. That's interesting in and of itself. Second thing, the only exception in the literature is unemployment. People who are working and lose their job move to a permanently lower level of satisfaction and do not return. And I think that that's worth grappling with. And then finally, work is critical for economic opportunity. Through, through redistribution and transfers, we can maintain somebody at any level. It's just a question of how much we're willing to spend. But we're going to have to send them just as much the next year. If you actually want somebody to be building a life of their own, developing skills, moving forward, uh, they need to actually be engaged in the productive economy in the first place. So it matters for individuals. It's incredibly important for families. And here, especially for men, work is an incredibly important predictor of family formation. It's an even bigger predictor of family stability. Unemployment as a driver of divorce is like order of magnitude bigger than the kind of thing you usually see in the social science research. Men who lose their jobs get divorced. Uh, and, and work also turns out to be really important for kids. Kids have better outcomes growing up in families where there are adults working, and kids even have better outcomes just growing up in communities where more of the other adults are working. And so if we want stable families, if we want opportunity for kids, we can't have that map being dark red. We actually have to care that people can support their families. It's incredibly important for communities, okay? When, when you do not have work, you have much higher levels of crime and addiction. You have much lower levels of social capital. Work is a nexus of community. Work is a place to which people get up and go every day. It's the means by which they consider the needs of others and serve each other. Uh, it's also where a lot of our charitable work and so forth comes from. And that this is a critical point that, that I think is overlooked in, in very concrete economic terms. Um, every community has to make something that the rest of the world wants. Eco economists have trained us to think of our obsession with manufacturing as this like nostalgic, irrational kind of thing that we cling to. That's not true. Manufacturing matters for a reason. It's the way that we make things that we can send to the rest of the world in return for all the things we want the rest of the world to send us. The cars, the medicines, the energy, the computers. Okay, you can have a services-based economy in which 80% of the people are serving each other coffee. But you can't all serve each other coffee. And what happens in a community where the tradable sector has left, where you're not actually making anything the world wants anymore, is you have to do what I call exporting need. Okay, your eligibility for transfer payments actually becomes the means by which you attract cash and resources from the rest of the world. So you drive through a, a depressed region of this country, you see the dilapidated shopping plaza, uh, and in the middle is a sparkling occupational therapy office. You say, what the hell is that doing there? That occupational therapy practice is the town's exporter. They are exporting to the nation's taxpayers care of the people in the town on disability. And so when you see that map getting darker and darker red, one of the things you're seeing 
is communities that no longer have a means to support themselves collectively within the broader national economy. They actually need those transfer payments as the way to keep the economy running. And that's obviously not an attractive or sustainable long-term model. <clears throat> Finally, work is actually really important to the economy. I realize that's sort of a dumb, obvious thing to say, but again, it's something that we've ignored. Being able to produce things uh, is incredibly important to the trajectory of the economy over time. So what you do to maximize that economic growth and consumption at a single point isn't necessarily the thing you would do to actually make sure you had a robust presence in the industries that were going to grow and thrive and gain productivity. Okay? If you want those things, you need to be concerned about who's developing new technology and how it's going to be shared. You need to be concerned about which industries even make productivity gains possible. Right? People aren't any more productive at cutting hair than they were 100 years ago. The reason you can charge $30 now for a haircut that you used to be able to charge $3 for is because cutting that hair of someone that's 10 times more productive becomes 10 times more valuable. But if you don't have that underlying economic activity where the productivity gains are occurring, the services economy can't grow with it. And finally, what you're actually doing turns out to be very important to what you then invest in. Okay? If you don't have uh, a robust industrial economy that has the capabilities, that has the workers that can do those kinds of things, the next generation of investors coming through isn't going to build those kinds of businesses. I speak a lot on business school campuses and I ask them, is anyone here actually planning to go to anything that's going to employ a single less skilled worker, that's going to boost the productivity of a single person without a college degree? Usually you get no hands. Maybe you get one hand from someone whose dad runs a construction company. But they're all going to work in technology and finance because those are the sectors of the economy that have remained robust over time. And they're all going to claim that they're adhering to corporate social responsibility as they do that because they're going to like buy a carbon offset or something. Okay, but they're not actually attending to the social health of the country. So that's one reason this is true, that we need to focus on work and not just consumer welfare. The second piece of this is to recognize that policy actually has to do something about it, that an economy is not going to just generate this healthy labor market on its own. And that's for two reasons. One, it's because supply in the labor market is not responsive to market forces. People aren't products, and I mean that in the moral sense, but I also mean that in the economic sense. You can have as strong a market signal as you want, screaming that chemists are worth five times more than cashiers, and our families are not going to change their production lines from chemists to cashiers. The people that you actually have in your country are the people that you have, irrespective of what the market might like. So that's one problem. The second problem is that the efficient outcome isn't necessarily the good one. So notwithstanding what I just said, the labor market will still give you an efficient outcome, but that efficient outcome isn't necessarily going to be one that uses everybody. In most markets, that's great. That's exactly what you want a market to do. The market tells you you've overproduced this. You have to write that off, and that's a great signal, and, and people go bankrupt, or people make a lot of money, and everybody adjusts moving forward. That's the whole point of the market. If you have a social preference for actually everyone being able to work and support their families, then you can't just take whatever outcome the market gives you. Okay? We haven't just been rhetorically, we have been literally writing off all of the people that the market doesn't want. Because as long as the market gives us an efficient outcome and produces the growth, we think we're maximizing our welfare. But we're not. So if you want the market to give you a particular outcome, then you have to actually be attended to the conditions in which it operates. Okay, the right, I think, has made a mistake in just trusting that the market will automatically deliver a good outcome. The left makes the mistake of saying, well, we don't like the outcome, so what we should do is just sort of yell at the market until it, it does something better. Um, but a market is just a neutral, neutral processing mechanism. It takes the conditions it's operating in and spits out an answer. And if you don't like the answer, you actually have to look to those underlying conditions and ask, why is it giving this thing? And what would we do differently in our society if we wanted a different answer? So that's why I think the water working hypothesis is true. I just started talking a little bit about what it might imply. But I want to make that more concrete in a couple of ways. So one thing it implies is that what we've been doing, we can't keep doing. Okay? The standard response when we go back to the pundits who said, well, what should we do about apparently people are unhappy and voted for Trump, 
Um, one answer is that we need to flood the zone with better social programs, right? We're just going to have to have more taxing, more spending, and redistributing. We've already sort of talked about why redistribution is not the solution to the problem. There are two other answers you hear a lot that I want to touch on briefly. One is relocation. Oh, well, if everyone just moved to places where there's lots of opportunity, we would solve the problem. Uh, and the other is education. Well, only we make our education system work better, everyone can be more successful. Um, these both run afoul of, of something that, that comes along with the emphasis on work, which is the importance of pluralism. Okay, one of the really nice things about consumer welfare, the economic pie, is that you're just talking in the aggregate. You can always move the money around, and once everyone has money, they can buy whatever they want. If we actually care about productivity, about being a productive contributor to your community, then the fact that people are really different actually matters a lot. And you have to take those differences into account. So relocation, we think that it is part of the American ethos that people move from distressed areas to prosperous areas. And that's actually been declining over time, and we just need to get it back somehow. It is true that people move. It is more true, though, that people stay. So this is the population of Iowa every decade since 1880. And what you'll see is from 1880 to 1980, through the entire mechanization of agriculture, the population of Iowa grew every decade. This is Maine through deindustrialization. Maine's population has been growing every decade since the late 1800s. And most strikingly, this is Oklahoma. So our quintessential story of relocating is the Okies leaving the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Dust Bowl 1930s, population of Oklahoma declined by less than 2.5%. Now, one interesting thing to know about that is farmers were actually least likely to leave. Uh, and actually, people were much more likely to leave in general. The population declined because fewer people moved in. So yes, fewer people moved to Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl. That's very true. But the vast majority of people in Oklahoma stayed in Oklahoma. More generally, most Americans still live within 18 miles of their mother. Okay? That's talk on college campuses and let people know their, their brains explode. <laughs> Most adult Americans live within 18 miles of their mother. Almost 40% have never left their hometown. And in general, those without college degrees are more, more likely to stay close to home. So we can want people to move. And we can hope, you know, what if like, instead of one or two percent moving like, hey, let's get that up to five or ten percent. You could do that, but 90 percent are still going to be where they are. And if you do that, by the way, the five or ten percent that you move are going to be likely the most ambitious and uh, entrepreneurial and so forth. So not only will you still have 90 percent of the people there, uh, you will have actually made the problem worse. So we're not going to move ever to opportunity. We are actually going to have to bring economic opportunity to the places where everybody lives. It's also worth noting, as we wrecked our labor market over the past few decades, that the attractiveness of moving to the big city has actually declined. So this is wages per hour based on how dense the city is. So as you move from left to right in each of these boxes, you get to denser cities from small towns. And the gray line, the gray dots, are college educated. The orange dots are not college educated. What you see in the 1950s is that, yes, college educated people earn more. Uh, but there was that nice upward slope for both. As you move to denser cities, wages went up. As you move across, still true in the 1980s, but kind of starting to flatten out a little bit. And by the time you get to 2015, there isn't even a premium. So it's a lot more expensive to go live in a big city, but you're not even getting paid more. And then of course the other thing you'll notice is that the orange line just sort of flat sagged down as the gray line kept moving. And so telling those orange folks on the left in 2015, well, why don't you go be those folks on the right, isn't really much of an answer. Education. Not everyone can be a knowledge worker. Okay? I'm all for education reform and pursuing better outcomes. But we need to acknowledge and grapple with just how bad we are at it and how badly we have failed. This is most recent data, starting with 100 students who enter the ninth grade what happens to them as they move through our pipeline. So about 18 still won't graduate from high school on time. Of those who do, about 25 won't even enroll in college. Of the roughly 57% who do enroll in college, about half 
will not graduate within even 150% of the expected time. And of those who do graduate, about 40% won't actually then take a job that even requires a degree. So by the time you get to the end of that, you're down to less than one in five Americans actually going high school to college to career, which is, of course, what we focus all of our effort and resources on. You might think, well, okay, but at least we're, we're working hard at this. Well, we, we are spending hard at it. We've doubled what we spend per pupil since the 1970s in real terms. But this is the effect on test scores, okay? The National Standardized Test for 17-year-olds, math scores standardized to the same outcomes, up less than 1% in math and in reading. SAT scores are actually down since the 70s. Now, that's partly because more people are taking the SAT, but we're certainly not producing a much larger group of folks prepared for college. And we even haven't moved up the high school graduation rate that much. We've still got roughly one in five not even completing high school. And so when you add all this up, this is from a wonderful study done by David Deming uh, at the Harvard School of Education for the Brookings Institution. This is the share of Americans who earn a bachelor's degree by age 25. Not the year they do it, but by their birth cohort. So 1950 is people who were born in 1950, getting to college in the early 70s, about 30% of them earned a bachelor's. Here we are, people born in 1990, recently going through college, 31%. So, you know, so if we keep doing this for like 2,800 more years, we're gonna have everybody through a bachelor's degree. Uh, but in the short run, we're not. What all, of these, what all of these efforts we have made have in common is they are efforts to say, we actually shouldn't sacrifice anything. We should make no changes to the structure of our society and our economy. We should either simply write people a check to go away, or we should somehow change them into the people who we think will work for the society and the economy that we like. And the reality is that if we actually want this to work, we're actually going to have to go the other way. We're actually going to have to ask, what are the actual fundamental changes in our society and our economy that we're prepared to make that are going to be much more painful for us than writing a bigger check, that are actually going to create the conditions for a labor market where everyone can support their families and their communities? So this is, this is the whole middle part of the book. I'm not, I don't have time to go all through this at length, but I want to mention it, and then in the Q&A, uh, we can get to any of it that you're, you're interested in. But just to give some examples, uh, environmental regulation, the way that we incredibly aggressively, stringently regulate our environment is the ideal trade-off for somebody earning $200,000 a year working in an office in a coastal city. It is not an appropriate trade-off for somebody earning $35,000 a year in the industrial economy. And asking someone, actually, we would like to redistribute in that way. We would like you to accept dirtier air for your kids because it's going to mean better jobs for a lot of people. Uh, now you're really talking about redistribution, but it would make a really big difference. Okay? Reorienting our education system, which I remember is our most regressive institution in this society, from serving the winners to serving the people who are falling behind. We spend $150 billion a year subsidizing college. We spend essentially zero on you if you don't go to college. And that should frankly flip. Anyone who thinks they're going to get a return on going to college, by all means, pay it back over the rest of your life. But let's actually build a pathway for the people who aren't going to college. Let's make sure our schools focus at least much on that. And let's actually track, let's actually have a new track for people who are on a non-college pathway. Now, people get very upset about this. They say tracking is unfair, tracking is nice. You say to them, okay, there's no alternative to tracking. We just only have one track, and it's called the college track. If you really only want to have one track, it should be a track for the median student, which means it's going to be a vocational track. And upper income people can send their kids to enrichment classes three towns over. And if that's what no tracking meant, then support for tracking would build very quickly. Uh, but we owe folks who are not headed towards success in college at least as much investment as we make in the college path. Trade and immigration are really difficult issues from a labor market perspective. From a consumer welfare perspective, it's very easy. More trade and immigration are always better. And all of those studies that tell you how great trade has been are telling you in consumer welfare terms. In fact, the bigger the trade deficit you have, the better off you are. 
The Chinese just sent us $100 million of giant flat screen TVs and we didn't even have to send them anything in return, right? That sounds fantastic, unless you're a worker. And from the perspective of workers, balanced trade, making sure that we actually make as much stuff for the rest of the world as they make for us is critically important to the health of the labor market. And likewise, when you talk about immigration, immigration can be a wonderful thing for an economy, but if you have a major, major problem in your society, maybe the biggest problem is an excess of less skilled labor that's really struggling, and you want the labor market to work better for them, you don't add more or less skilled workers to that part of the labor market. Again, there are plenty of other rationales for a different immigration policy, but if workers are actually what you want to talk about, that's how you have to think about it. Last two, uh, organized labor is something that everybody has decided to kind of let die. Uh, the left sort of just has these legacy institutions that fund their campaigns, uh, but become an ever smaller part of the workforce. The right just sort of cheers their death. Uh, but organized labor is something we should want. We should want a good, modern system of organized labor that actually benefits workers, that helps them collaborate with employers in ways that actually make them more productive. And finally, we have to reorient the safety net. We spend more than a trillion dollars a year on redistribution. All but 6% of that either ignores work or more generally actually discourages work because we take it away as soon as you start working. Now, there are a lot of people who can't work and they need a safety net. But if we spend $800 billion on that and $200 billion on actually trying to support work, we could do what's called a wage subsidy, which is just like you have your payroll tax, the FICA line taking money out of every paycheck. You could have a line under it called work credit. And for low-wage workers, you could actually be putting money into paychecks. And the most important effect of that, as with anything you subsidize, is you get more of it. You would encourage more workers to come back into the labor force. Uh, you would also encourage employers to offer those kinds of jobs. Employers would get some of the benefit of the subsidy, too. And the result would be to make it more attractive to build businesses that use less skilled workers. And then not the main point, but my side effect is you'd also get more resources to those low-income households, which, yes, it's redistribution, but of all the ways we could redistribute to those who are falling behind, this is the one that's at least tied to work and attached to the productive contributions people make. So those are the kinds of policies I think we have to focus on. And I think we have to, to flip our sequence. We've essentially said the non-negotiable starting point is what we call the open society, globalization, immigration, and so forth. These are the, the non-negotiable starting points for any right-thinking person. And yes, 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 we're going to have to think of something for a better spot in mind. And we need to flip that around. Recognize, yeah, everyone thinks higher levels of trade, higher levels of immigration. Even most Trump voters, actually, would tell you higher levels of trade, higher levels of immigration. But the question is, can you prove that you can do it in a way that's actually going to work for everybody? And we have to earn the right to push toward those things that we think would ultimately be attractive by proving that they will be ones that are going to work for everybody who's already here. Thank you. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much. I, um, so my first impression is that this all sounds very good. I'd like you to address how you think this would gain any traction, um, particularly related to the current announced candidates for president. And Barring you identifying anyone who you think might be oriented in this fashion, who would you like to see carry this banner? <laughs> so it's a very, it's a fantastic question. It points to to something I think is coming. I mean, the it has been a very exciting time the first couple of years of the Trump administration on the right of center because anything goes. Right? There are now having Trump at one end of Pennsylvania Avenue certainly suppresses the sort of tangible progress you can make in a lot of cases. But for the right of center, for the think tank world, for Senate offices, there's a tremendous amount of kind of 
work and thinking going on about exactly these kinds of things. Um, the left of center, Trump has had the opposite effect on them. Everything has to come through the lens of hashtag resist. Uh, and, and I don't think that's been constructive, but that's about to break wide open as the primary starts. Um, and as the primary starts, sorry, I like standing out here, but I'm going to break the mic, so I'll go back behind the podium. Um, not everyone is going to be in this lane that we're currently seeing of like, who can most, well, I don't want to insult all the fine Democratic candidates, but like, like is that really what you're going to fight about for the next 16 months? Um, of the declared candidates, Amy Klobuchar is the only one who has tried to indicate that she wants to focus more on some of these issues. But there are a couple of others. Sherrod Brown uh, is by far the leading left of center person who, who would speak in these terms. Uh, and Joe Biden, if he runs. And so there is going to be that, that lean in the left of center. Uh, ultimately, we are going to find out whether there's any place for that anymore in the Democratic Party. I mean, you have this group that has abandoned the Republican Party and headed over to the Democrats because some of these more identity-related issues and the globalization they see as the non-negotiable starting point. As the Democrats actually start getting this, you're going to have some people kind of passing them going the other direction. Uh, my hope is that someone of the Sherrod Brown, Joe Biden mold uh, can actually emerge from, from a Democratic primary. Um, Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado is another, I think, very thoughtful person who's, uh, some people have said, might run. John Hickenlooper, the former governor of Colorado, would fit in this lane uh, if he chose to run. Um, but you could also end up with a world of, like, no one cares about that at all, and your top four finishers are Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Cory Booker, uh, at which point the, essentially the realignment will be complete and you will have a Democratic Party that is uh, kind of the old Obama coalition plus never Trumpers, and you'll have a Republican coalition that is now the working class party. I don't, I don't know which will happen, but I suspect over the long term we are going to see that complete realignment. And you're all welcome to vote Republican in 2020. <laughs> oh, um, do I call? Okay. Uh, excuse me, I've got, I've got a microphone, so I don't have to talk. I think that means you get to go next. <laughs> I have a microphone, and I will defer to you. Well, yeah, I'd like to start out by thanking you very much. I've got to, I've got to process all of this. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is a different mind, I think, and I've got to figure out how to connect a number of the dots, which are very comfortable. You. The one topic, though, that you can really talk a lot about is actually the biggest topic in the United States right now, which is the uh, lack of equality. Um, and um, we generally talk about it in terms of the top 1%. Well, in fact, economists will know that uh, the uh, Cheney coefficients will tell you that it's not the top 1%. Uh, the people from 99 to 99.9 .9 haven't changed a job in the last uh, 40 years. It's actually the top one-tenth of one percent uh, where this great wealth occurs. And so I'm wondering whether these forces that you talk about uh, really apply when so much wealth is in uh, productivity general or uh, benefit is realized by the top one-tenth of one percent. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting issue because in a sense, I, what I'm talking about is that inequality matters a lot and we, we need to be grappling more with inequality. Uh, I would say that the top tenth of a percent doesn't really matter at all. That the, whether the top tenth of a percent has a hundred million or a billion or a hundred billion dollars, uh, really, has almost no consequence for what's happening to the median and below. Uh, and that the type of inequality we have to worry about is, how, is the chunk being left behind, not the, not the chunk getting extraordinarily ahead. There are a couple of exceptions to that. I mean, one thing that really matters is like, how does one get to the top tenth of a percent? You know, something I always tell the business school students is like, take a look at who your school's named after. It's invariably an industrialist 
who made their money building a massive organization and saw their role as a capitalist need to find ways to use workers more productively. Um, we now build an economic model that says that's an absurd way to try to get to the top 10 percent. We get to the top 10 is some combination of financial engineering or maybe like making a really cool act. Um, so in that sense, I would say there's more tetragram at the top. Um, but, but ultimately, I don't think that's the problem. Ultimately, I think the question is what's happening to the, to the huge mass of folks who are either haven't gone anywhere or have actually gone down. And that if the top of the road was getting way ahead, but everyone was seeing progress, I think that would probably be fine. And, it, and it's that absence that we have to talk about. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's so frustrating, for me at least, to see you know, where we're starting out here in the Democratic primary with the emphasis on a wealth tax and a, you know, tax people up $10 million or whatever. It's like, if you have something that you, you would like to spend money on that we think would actually help, I agree that would be an appropriate place to look for the money. But doing it just for the sake of suppressing the wealth at the top, and a lot of them acknowledge that's actually what this is. They don't even think it'll raise much revenue. It's just a way to suppress wealth at the top. It uh, doesn't really achieve very much. And on the flip side, spending more money isn't actually what we need. All the policy I just talked about, none of it costs more than what we're doing today. It's about, it's about choices and priorities. And so uh, I think we, should have a, we need to talk a lot about the problems of inequality in this country, but it's not about any segment at the top. It's about the first 40 versus the next 40 in the sense. I'm just whoever she gives the money to all. Okay, so you kind of disregard the whole Know, top level of the economic spectrum and economic disparity on that end as there's such a negligible percentage of the population that it doesn't matter. But in your speech and in your working class, you talk about a large mass, the classic archetype of the working class, uneducated, unskilled worker. What percentage, what proportion of the modern day economy and the modern day population does that actually represent? How important actually is this in our communities comparative to the wealth mass by, say, the top 1%, the top 0.1%? So, sorry, so you mean how much, what share of the population fits in this kind of group? Yeah, or? under your definition, how would you describe this as being, you know, how much of an impact is this going to have on the average person? Is it representing the average person or is it yeah. the sub-average person? Or? So, I think the dividing line is a college degree. Um, uh, outcomes, there are both incredible divisions in society today between the college educated population and the non-college population in terms of all sorts of indices of social well-being and so forth. Um, and that's also the dividing line on which the trajectory has been so different. So people with, and, and this is the other thing about, you know, it's true that the top 10% is getting way ahead. Uh, everyone with college degrees has seen really healthy wage gains, and productivity gains over the past few decades. Uh, it's the non-college population that has been stagnant. Uh, and that is experiencing so many of the social problems today. Uh, and then there's also the some college population, which, first of all, ends up looking like the non-college population over time and like ran up an awful lot of debt in the process. And so they're, they end up being a kind of very interesting, complicated group that lands all over the place. But, you know, the, it's still 51% of Americans don't earn even a community college degree. And that's of, of young Americans. So if you look at across the population, you're still above 60% don't have a college degree. Um, and so you, you really are talking about the mass of the country. Oh, thank you. I'd like to thank you for your comments. They're very interesting. Um, I read part of your book. I haven't finished it. But in your book, you describe the impact of a single or double parent household. And you made the point in your book that it's very, very important. Um, you didn't discuss it today, and I didn't read the end of your book, so maybe you told us how to solve it. How do we solve the single versus double parent household? Because it's really a killer uh, if you grow up in a single parent household in terms of your success for your children. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a critically important point. I mean, one of the, and I told you the thing that blows audiences' minds most, which is the you know median person that's 18 miles from their mom. Um, the thing I've come across that blows my mind the most is the Brookings Institution did a wonderful study of economic mobility. So they looked at what quintile a kid is born into based on the income of their parents. 
and then what quintile of income they end up in. And we're used to seeing this and seeing that you know people at the bottom are relatively stuck at the bottom. But then they actually disaggregated it and showed the numbers for single parent versus two parent households. And it turned out that a kid growing up in the bottom quintile of income, but in a two parent household, had almost exactly an equal chance of landing in any quintiles of an adult. I mean, almost the exact epic, like it was like all five quintiles were between a 17 and a 23% chance of landing there, and you were more likely to end up in the top quintile than in the bottom. If you grew up in a single parent family in the bottom quintile, you were 10 times as likely to stay at the bottom as make it to the top quintile. And so what we, what we talk about as a mobility problem in the country, an opportunity problem, is entirely a single parent household mobility problem. Um, what you do about it is really hard. And there are so many factors, and some are economic and some are cultural, that I don't think anything is going to be the entire solution. Um, I think work and an improved labor market is part of the solution. And that's why if you go back to that official sort of statement of the of what I call the working hypothesis, the, the, the reason to care about the labor market, the reason to want people to have good jobs, isn't anything inherent about the work itself. It's that we want those jobs to be one that support healthy families and communities. Um, and you know, marriage for all of our romantic whatevers is actually a very concrete, rational, economic choice. And the structure in which it works and makes sense frequently is one in which a single earner, typically a man, can actually support the family. Like that's like a bedrock starting point of why marriages form and why they make sense, especially if you're, uh, especially if you're a young woman, um, and what we don't have. Um, and so it's certainly not the whole solution, but I think it's one of the reasons for folks on the right in particular to care a lot more about this economic stuff is to recognize that we can complain all we want about rap lyrics or whatever else, and you know, I think there are very serious cultural issues as well. Um, but we have to acknowledge that the economic conditions we create are part of the, the formula also. Because the reality is we also have a giant population in this country that is not having a family crisis. And it's called the college educated population. Like somehow for all the problems in our culture, for everything else, for all the, all the, libertine whatever that goes on on college campuses, everyone who operates in the labor market where they can still get a good job and support a family, like, they're still doing that. It's only the, it's only the people who are in the same culture, but in a really bad part of the labor market the economy, they're experiencing these problems. And so it's not the entire solution, but, but ultimately that's why I care so much about this issue, is because I think it's one of the things we have to get around. Thank you again. Uh, some of the questions might be related for you, but um, in the paradigm shift that you've described and some of what you've covered today, I'm sure there's, there's more stats in, in your book, but I'm wondering if you can draw a correlation between those elements and uh, recent growth in the freelance marketplace. Yeah, so I mean, the, so the freelance marketplace can mean a lot of different things. Um, there are a lot of sort of like studies of the gig economy and so forth, um, and they tend to be like ludicrously bad. Uh, BLM, Bureau of Labor Statistics in the Chamber of Commerce Center, in the Department of Commerce, have essentially retract one of its recent studies. People started looking at it and were like, they come up with like freelance and gig work is down because of the definition they had or something like that. Um, the best that we can tell, there are a couple of important things to note. One is that while freelance and gig type work is definitely up, it's still a very, very, very small share of the, of the labor market overall. Um, for me, what I think is what is most concerning is not, is not the freelancing per se, um, but, but the, the contracting, the efforts of firms to do everything they can to have as few employees as possible. Um, and there's some sense that like, oh, this is like, you know, firms obviously will try to do this and it's obviously rational. I'm like, actually it's not. 
having workers under your control in your firm, actually, other things equal makes a ton of business sense. Now, we've done everything we can to regulate and make as painful as possible having employees, in response to which firms are pushing them further away. But there's no reason that that has to be the model, or that firms would even want it to be the model. And so I think, you know, when we talk about a labor market that works well, it's really important to recognize that anything that we do that makes it harder and less attractive to actually hire a person and have them be a full-time employee at your firm um, is a mistake, is pushing against what we're actually trying to achieve. And that actually having an, it be an attractive economic model to employ full-time people and invest in them over time, um, that's sort of like the, the non-negotiable economic nucleus of, of making this work. Because, and by this I mean like capitalism. Um, because there are people for whom Uber or freelancing, like, that can be great, but what you find is that it really heavily relies on you bringing to the marketplace your own strong underlying endowments. Um, and particularly for, for the population we're talking about, the people who struggle to connect to the labor market, um, that is exactly what they lack. And so more than anybody else, they are a group that needs um, full-time employment and an employer that somehow we make it in that employer's interest to invest more in the work. I'd like to hear some of your specific policy ideas, or if that's too much to get into today, maybe just some places to start in, in the context of what I'll say next. Most of the big macroeconomic trends or labor trends are, are would be resisting a lot of what you're saying. I agree with the hypothesis. I agree with the economy is, is, is poisoned or is sick in some way. Something needs to be done about it. But if you look at, I just jotted down a few here, you know, one trend is like job churn. People are getting redeposited <coughs> more often and expect to find a new job. If people don't work for 20 years anymore, they work for two. The gig economy is, is one that working from home sounds cool until you don't have health insurance and then it's not. Underemployment is a chronic issue. Automation and AI is coming. We didn't cover that at all today. Jobs are just being deleted from, from being even possible any longer. And then you mentioned some of the trends of organized labor. So that there's all these corrosive effects or these headwinds to get to the place that you're describing we need to get to. So what are some of the specific policies where like where do we where do we start? What's the priority order moving forward? Yeah, sure. So so to to start with kind of some of the the underlying trend issues, which I think are really important, um, I think it's important to recognize that people move jobs more often, uh, but job churn as an economic measure is actually way down. We're at a very, very low level of job churn. Um, and likewise, automation is actually occurring slower than ever. I mean, we measure very carefully productivity, how much stuff someone can do in an hour, and automation is just one of the ways you make it possible for someone to do more stuff in an hour. Um, better training, better, you know, there are all better processes, there are lots of things you do. Productivity growth is at the lowest level on record and has been for the last five or six years. Um, and the period since 2000 has been worse than the period before that. Um, so so I, I, I say that not to be pedantic, but because it, it's a really important point, which is that automation and churn um, are actually central to boosting worker productivity. They are the way to boost worker productivity. And, and that's exactly what we want. And so the, the idea of the, the working hypothesis isn't to like protect people in the jobs they have, necessarily. It's to create a labor market in which people are going to be able to find jobs in which they will be more productive. And for that, um, automation in particular needs to happen a heck of a lot faster than it's happening right now. Um, if you look at what, what has actually happened in the economy, and you, know, you see the huge loss of manufacturing jobs, for instance, and it's, it's technically true, you can say every time we automate something, we've destroyed a job. But by that standard, we've been destroying millions of manufacturing jobs every decade, including in the, you know, the boom of the 50s and 60s. Um, what's changed is, Think of kind of as a mental model, it used to be if you had 10 workers who could each make a widget, and now we introduced some technology, and now they can each make two widgets, 
right? That's great. Now we can sell 20 widgets instead of 10 widgets. Output goes up. Each worker is twice as productive. They can command a higher wage. And that's what happened in kind of the 1947 to 1973 period. We doubled productivity, but we also doubled output. So everyone was still working, and they were making twice as much stuff, and wages were up. What's happened in the more recent period isn't that all of a sudden automation took off and we were gaining productivity so fast we threw everybody out of work. What happened is that output stopped growing. So we shifted to a model where, well, if you can make twice as many widgets, uh, well, then that's great. We only need five people to make the 10 widgets. Can I just turn this to one specific example? So I don't know if we don't have too much more time. Like I'm talking about jobs being automated to the extent of being eliminated completely, and, and we're getting the most common job title in the United States is driver. Yeah, cab driver, truck driver, you, you know where I'm going with this. We are some number of years away from being able to automate a good portion of that job. Those, none of those, a huge portion of those people don't even, don't have college degrees. They're on the wrong side of that line you drew earlier. So it, it feels closer and it feels, um, you know, more Armageddon scenario than what's being painted even, even here. How, like, how can the United States break through that sort of an impending inflection point? Right. So I don't think there is an impending inflection point. I think self-driving cars are a good example. Self-driving cars, when like, you listen to the Google guy talk about it now, are like 20 to 30 years away. I mean, what's going to happen, it's not like all of a sudden you're going to like upload something to your car and they're all going to be self-driving. You're going to slowly progress as we have with any technology. So first we're going to get to the point where Yes, you know, in like Phoenix with perfect weather and nicely painted roads, you can do certain things. And then we're getting to the point where you can caravan trucks. So you have to have a, on a highway, so you have to have a driver in the lead truck, but other trucks can follow it. But when it gets off the interstate, someone's still gonna have to drive it. Then you're gonna get to the point where like, you can have a truck driver who's sitting in a remote facility somewhere, all tabbing between nine different trucks and taking care of whichever one needs it, and so on and so forth. 30 years from now, you might have gotten rid of all those jobs, or more likely you're going to have gone to many fewer jobs and they're going to be alt tabbing. Um, but, but that kind of process, when you then actually go back and say, like, well, what's that on an annual basis? You end up right back in the kind of 2 to 3% productivity growth we always see. And what I think you realize is, is two really important things. One, you know, the technology that's coming down the pike is really cool. It's not cooler than the technology we already did. Like, robotics and AI are cool, but so are, like, electricity. <laughs> I mean, or, you know, the steam engine. Or, you know, it took us, like, 60 years to actually deploy electricity and have farms using it. Or, you know, or the combustion engine. Or computers and the internet. Something I emphasize um, to... to to business folks all the time, it's like, we've had computers in MIT labs since the 1940s, and we're like, still trying to teach your HR person to use one, right? Like the number of layers, of, so it's absolutely true there are things in the lab today that suggest, yeah, you could do an incredible thing. The amount of time it's going to take to actually deploy that, these things happen very slowly, and they always have. And the second point is that the, the reason ultimately they happen slowly is because workers are the constraint. Um, that it turns out that there are vanishingly few jobs you can actually automate and just take the person out completely. And so like, um, there's a really, really, really bad study that gets cited all the time from Oxford University. And it's the famous one that's like, 47% of jobs will be automated in the next 20 years. If you actually look what they did, they just went job title by job title and assigned a probability of automation. And you know what the most automated driving title they picked was? School bus driver. It drives the same route every day. It doesn't even have to go out when the weather is bad, right? And then you talk to a parent, and you're like, hey, what do you think about locking your kid in a metal box for 30 minutes a day? And you realize, actually, school bus driver is multiple different things. It's not just the, and, and so what you have to do is actually go in terms of tasks. And McKinsey and um, the OECD have both done very good studies where they break down jobs by tasks. And what you find is that there are lots and lots of jobs that can be um, uh, some part of them, some of the tasks can be automated. But you still have to have the worker there. 
which first of all means you can only automate as fast as you can teach the worker to work with the new technology. Uh, and secondly, it means it's going to, if you can do it, it's going to accrue to the benefit of the worker. They're going to be there, they're going to be more productive. And so what drives me nuts is when you, you hear employers complain about a so-called skills gap, right? There's no such thing as a skills gap. I mean, there's an infinity skills gap. I could employ infinity MIT PhDs at $9 an hour and, and make money doing that. But that's a really dumb business description of something that doesn't exist. A, a skills gap isn't a market failure. It's a market signal that what you're trying to do does not align with the people who actually exist in the world. And so the, the, the path that we have to move toward, I'm not actually going to answer your question about specific policies, but I promise they're in the book and we should talk more after. <laughs> Um, I'd be happy to look at all these other nice people. Uh, but, but one way of thinking about what we have to do is how do you actually get to get and frankly get back to a world where the type of businesses people want to build, the type of investments they want to make, are ones that say, how do I take the people I actually have and make them more productive? Because there's no other pool of like highly skilled, unemployed people sitting over there to charge in and work with the new tech. And so that's going to have to be the formula for productivity gains and growth over time. And the reality is that it's not that it's happening too fast right now, it's that it's not happening right now. That's what I'm saying. Okay, we got to take one last question. It's got to be short. I'll, I'll keep it. The question will be short, I'm not sure about the answer. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for coming and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, a prior uh, Global Economic Trends lecturer said uh, a number of years ago uh, that the greatest boost uh, to the American economy was the GI Bill, uh, that it sent hundreds of thousands of men and women to college and allowed, you know, for uh, low interest rate investments in homes, family creation, all of these things. But I think primary among, amongst all those factors is education. Is there a prayer, a hope, uh, a, a policy uh, that you can see in the future that would uh, focus on a re -ed not re to educating uh, a large number of people who, according to your graph, over 25, uh, only 16 out of 100, uh, get a college education? Yeah. So I actually, I think the GI Bill is a great way of thinking about it. I actually use it as an example in the book because the critical thing to recognize is even at the height of the GI Bill taking effect and, and really boosting college enrollment, fewer than a quarter of American young people were in college. Um, and so I mean, if you actually go back and say like, what share of the people returning from the front went to college, you're still in that universe we're in now, where like a quarter to a third of young people could make effective use of what we call college. Um, and so applying, I think it's the wrong lesson to take from the GI Bill to say, well, we, we've got this 35% in, couldn't we do a GI Bill to get the next 20%? Because that's not what the GI Bill actually did. It took the equivalent of people who are absolutely in college today and funded it. Um, I, I think the better way of thinking about it is to say, gosh, if instead of giving that next chunk, offering them absolutely nothing, like, what if we did offer them something? You know, what if, I mean, for less than we spend trying to get someone through college, you could put someone on a track where, in their later years of high school, they did less classroom work, they started working part-time with an employer, they had got further technical training, they had a couple of years with part-time community college training tied to what they were doing in the workplace, and they get to age 20 with, like, three years of work experience, earnings in the bank, an industry credential, a job, uh, and by the way, we've spent so much less than we would have on college that you can also like give them a $25,000 account for future learning. Um, and I think that's how we have to start thinking about it, is not how can we take the next tranche and somehow turn them into college grads, but what would it actually look like to meet these folks where they are on the trajectories they're on and, and give value to that. And I think that connects them back to the previous question when you asked like, why aren't we, why aren't employers sort of making the investments in productivity? 
And one thing that drives me nuts is we have our, like criticizing these low wage employers who don't invest in training for their workers. And it's like, well, all the fancy high wage employers get to wait and hire somebody after we just spent, you know, fifty thousand dollars on their college education. And now you're complaining that this low wage employer doesn't want to like do anything for the, you know, high school grad or college dropout. It, it's completely out of whack. And so if we actually it will look very different from college infrastructure, but committed to building the infrastructure and public support for because at the end of the day you can't run a federal training program. The employer is going to have to do the training. Um, and giving that as much support as we give college, I think is the is the best we can do. Thank you so much. Thank you.